It's Wednesday, May 19th. For the first time since the fighting began, President Biden publicly pressures Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu about reaching a truce with Palestinian fighters. But the Israeli leader blows him off, at least for now, as Israeli airstrikes kill at least six more people across the Gaza Strip and destroy the home of an extended family of 40 people. After we returned from dawn prayer, and while it was still dark, we were surprised by a drone rocket, which was followed by an S-16 missile 10 minutes later, taking down the house, while all the surrounding houses sustained damage. The House of Representatives votes to create an independent commission on the deadly January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol, sending the legislation to an uncertain future in the Senate as Republican leaders work to stop a bipartisan investigation that is opposed by former President Trump. There's an effort on the part of the House Republican leadership to make sure we forget that that fateful day ever happened. A woman heard shouting at police to bring Nancy Pelosi out to be hanged during the attack on the U.S. Capitol is among those charged today in a new round of arrests. Donald Trump facing a one-two punch of criminal investigations in New York, with the state attorney's general's office announcing its ongoing civil inquiry into the former president and his businesses is now a criminal matter. While the Manhattan District Attorney's Office scours Trump's tax records with a former mafia prosecutor helping to run its investigation. And four more California counties move to the least restrictive yellow tier of coronavirus restrictions. Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, Amador, and Orange counties. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles. This is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. After firmly siding with Israeli President Benjamin Netanyahu in public, President Biden today altered his tone. Biden spoke with the prime minister again today, the fourth time in a week. The White House says Biden told Netanyahu that he expected significant de-escalation in the fighting by the end of the day. Biden asked Netanyahu to move toward the path to a ceasefire. Biden has come under growing congressional pressure to take a firmer stance against Israel, which is the recipient of billions of dollars of military aid from the U.S. each year. The chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Gregory Meeks, however, no longer plans to send a letter to Biden requesting to delay a $735 million sale of precision-guided missiles to Israel. Meeks reportedly faced significant pushback to sending the letter from other Democrats on his committee. But Biden's change of mind about putting public pressure on Netanyahu to relent hasn't phased the Israeli leader, at least not yet. Simon Marks reports. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says he's determined to continue battling Hamas in Gaza despite a demand from U.S. President Joe Biden for an immediate de-escalation of the Israeli military campaign. The Prime Minister said the military operation that has already killed 219 Palestinians, 63 of them children, will continue. I greatly appreciate the support of the American President, our friend Joe Biden, for the self-defense of the State of Israel. I'm determined to continue continue this operation until its aim is met to restore peace and security to you, citizens of Israel. Twelve Israelis have died in the conflict over the last ten days as Hamas has pummeled Israel with thousands of rockets. What of the prospects for a ceasefire? Patrick Wintour is diplomatic editor of The Guardian newspaper in London. Hamas is uh, saying it's willing to have a ceasefire, but they also want some confirmation from Israel that they're not going to continue the attacks on the Alaska Mosque in 
Jerusalem. So there's issues in Jerusalem that Hamas are demanding must be uh, changed, not just the situation in Gaza. Simon Marks reporting. Israel again pummeled targets in Gaza with airstrikes, while Palestinian fighters in Gaza bombarded Israel with rocket fire throughout the day. In a sign of potential escalation, fighters in Lebanon fired a barrage of rockets into northern Israel. Six more Palestinians died in Gaza today, including a journalist. Another Israeli airstrike targeted a building housing 40 members of an extended family, including Professor Ahmed Al-Astal. He said they all had to run for their lives. After we returned from dawn prayer, and while it was still dark, we were surprised by a drone rocket, which was followed by an F-16 missile 10 minutes later, taking down the house, while all the surrounding houses sustained damage. This behind us reflects the humanity in them, demolishing the houses while its inhabitants are inside, people leaving their houses during the night, terrifying children and the elderly. By God, we left with our mother. We couldn't carry her, but the fear made us carry her. But in spite of all this, we will remain on our lands, and the occupation, and those who came with it, and those who support it, will eventually demise, and the people of Palestine will remain in Palestine. Some 78,000 Palestinians have fled their homes. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, at least 223 Palestinians have been killed by Israeli airstrikes, including 63 children and 36 women, with 1,530 people wounded. Twelve people in Israel, including a five-year-old boy, a teenager, and a soldier, have been killed by rockets fired from Gaza. Yesterday, shops were shuttered across cities in Gaza, the occupied West Bank, and in villages and towns inside Israel, as Palestinians observed a general strike to protest against occupation and Israel's ongoing bombardment of the blockaded Gaza enclave. The strike, supported by Hamas, the group running Gaza, and Fatah, the ruling party of the Palestinian Authority, but not organized by either of them, led to the suspension of all economic activity and the closure of educational institutions. It was the first time in decades that Palestinians across the political divide took part in such a general strike. And it gave hope to some observers, like Rashid Khaladi, the Edward Said Professor of Modern Arab Studies at Columbia University, of a new unified Palestinian political force, perhaps new leadership, and perhaps even new tactical weapons in the Palestinian fight against Israeli military might. Khaladi spoke with Brian Edwards Tikert, host of the Upfront Morning Program. The Israeli uh, government and the Israeli security establishment are are perfectly capable of dealing with violence in the form of uh, rockets or anything else. In fact, that is their preferred form of Palestinian action. Um, for them, it enables it enables them to, to picture the Palestinians in a certain way where Palestinian grievances and, and, the, and the, the constant nature of an occupation that's gone on now since 1967 for almost three generations and of what was done starting in 1948 is completely erased. And instead, there's sort of a perpetual beginning. Well, the rockets started uh, being fired, and that's the beginning of things. Instead of the incredible suffering inflicted on Gaza, for example, day in, day out, systematically, over now 14, 15 years by Israel. We forget that uh, when violence erupts. A strike, so action like this by civil society, they don't actually have a playbook for. I don't think it bothers them in the short run, but I think that if it leads to... Um, it leads to organization on a Palestine-wide basis. If it leads to a dilution of the, of the or, or a bre- breaking down of the barriers between Palestinians in Israel and Palestinians in the West Bank and Palestinians in Jerusalem and Gaza, um, as well as those in the diaspora, who I think were very much inspired, those in, in exile, very much inspired by this strike, then I think Israel will have a problem because it raises the idea that, in fact, Israel has created a single state reality. And now the Palestinians are responding by saying, yes, and we're a single people wherever we are. That's going to be a problem for Israel. 
um, in the long run, if, if of course, this, this develops in that direction. Um, Israelis love to talk about the temporary nature of an occupation that's gone on for 53 years. It's absurd when you think about it for a second. The amount of money that has been poured into the West Bank to incorporate it fully into Israel is mind boggling, much of it American money, by the way. Um, and yet the Israelis pretend that there's a difference between uh, this or that settlement and Tel Aviv or Haifa. There's no difference as far as Israeli, Israeli law is concerned, as far as Israelis are concerned, and as far as the unitary security establishment, which controls everything from the river to the sea. If the Palestinians begin to respond by saying, yes, you've created one state, and we are one people within that state, and you're going to have to deal with us, and we're as numerous as you are in that area between the river and the sea, if not slightly more numerous. Uh, I think Israel faces a different kind of problem than it faces when uh, it's able to, to, to put things into the box of rockets coming out of Gaza. Yeah, when we interviewed you on what I believe was day two of the bombardment of the Gaza Strip, you, you said this plays to the political benefit both of Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, attempted government in Israel uh, and Gaza's government in the Gaza Strip. They, they both strengthened their position uh, by posturing themselves uh, as defenders of their people and in armed combat. Um, what do you think the strike does to Hamas's standing? Well, I don't think it, it directly affects Hamas's standing, but I think it it shows a larger political vision than any of the Palestinian political parties has. In fact, they have no political vision. Hamas has no political vision. Fatah has no political vision. The one says resistance, the other says negotiations. There's nobody to negotiate with. And the resistance is leading to many people being killed. Now, a lot of Palestinians are gonna be, are gonna feel, feel bad that I would say such a thing. But um, I think it has to be understood that this is uh, in some measure uh, as I said a couple of days, a few days ago on your on your air, uh, an attempt to shore up their status, as well as it, it has to be said, the, the, the understandable reaction of people who are daily oppressed uh, and who are were enraged by the measures that were taken by Israel. Hamas is playing on that larger sentiment, which is a which is a universal sentiment. Palestinians know that the violence of occupation and the trauma of dispossession is a daily issue. Israel does stuff to them daily. The fact that this accumulates and accumulates and accumulates is completely ignored. The media is paying uh, ample attention today and for the last 10 days or 11 days. It pays no attention to people dying because they can't get out of the Gaza Strip for medical attention. It pays no attention to kids whose future is destroyed because they can't study abroad. It pays no attention uh, to the fact that people have eight or seven or six hours of electricity daily. The kind of routine violence uh, uh, inflicted by Israel on Gaza, uh, it's sort of sub, it's under a level where it reaches anybody's consciousness is what produces a support for Hamas doing things like it's doing. Um, the problem, of course, is that the Palestinians have to bring that forward themselves for people to see it in a way that is that is uh, that is visible and legible. Professor Rashid Khalidi teaches modern Arab studies at Columbia University. His latest book is entitled. The 100 Years' War on Palestine, A History of Settler Colonialism and Resistance, 1917 to 2017. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. The House of Representatives today passed a bill to create an independent January 6th commission to investigate the attack on the Capitol that delayed the presidential vote count on January 6th. The proposed January 6th commission is modeled after the September 11th commission that investigated terrorist attacks that occurred on that date and issued recommendations and a report that outsold a Harry Potter book. Republican defectors who joined Democrats gave the final vote a bipartisan cast, but that may not be enough to see the measure to passage in the closely divided Senate. Christopher Martinez reports. 35 Republicans joined Democrats in the House of Representatives to approve a bill creating a bipartisan commission to investigate the January 6th Capitol insurrection. During debate on the House floor, a few Republicans spoke in support of the bill, but most did not. 
to the dismay of Democrats. Tim Ryan is a Democrat from Ohio. I want, I want to thank the gentleman from New York and the other Republicans who are supporting this and thank them for their bipartisanship. To the other 90 percent of our friends on the other side of the aisle, holy cow, incoherence. No idea what you're talking about. Ben Gaz, you guys chased the former Secretary of State all over the country, spent millions of dollars. We have people scaling the Capitol, hitting the Capitol Police with lead pipes across the head, and we can't get bipartisanship. What else has to happen in this country? Ryan called the Republican opposition a slap in the face to every rank-and-file cop in the nation. If we're going to take on China, if we're going to rebuild the country, if we're going to reverse climate change, we need two political parties in this country that are both living in reality, and you ain't one of them. Republican Dan Bishop of North Carolina spoke against creating the commission. He took issue with calling the January 6th event an insurrection. When the images are raised, the lurid images about insurrection, let me just say this. If it was an insurrection, it was the worst example of an insurrection in the history of mankind. It was a riot. It was a mob. And it was significant. And it was troublesome. But this is not bipartisanship. Other Republicans claimed falsely that the commission would be controlled by staff picked by Democrats. That claim was disputed by Republican John Katko of New York, who negotiated the bill with Democrat Benny Thompson. Katko explained that the commission, five Democrats and five Republicans, would jointly set rules and choose staff with approval by both the Democratic chair and the Republican vice chair. Other Republicans complained that the commission would not look at violence beyond January 6th, Marjorie Taylor Greene is a Republican from Georgia. She says the media would use a commission to smear Donald Trump and his supporters and cover up what she calls the real damage. After, in this past year, we have witnessed violent riots in the American cities all over this country. We have witnessed tremendous damage. Minneapolis city officials estimate 700 buildings were damaged, burned, or destroyed, including 360 local businesses. There has not been a commission launched to study the reasons why that happened. There has not been an investigation to stop the BLM Antifa riots that have hurt innocent people, attacked government buildings, federal courthouses, taken over police precincts, uh, created autonomous zones in the city of Portland, and done so much damage to people all over the country. Several Democrats questioned why Republicans would oppose the measure. Trump does not want this commission. That can be my only explanation. Steny Hoyer is a Democrat from Maryland. He countered Republican complaints like those of Green, who say the commission's focus is too narrowly focused on the January 6th Capitol attack. An issue with reference to a unique event, not just a demonstration that's occurred in, uh, I grew up in the 60s. Whether it was civil rights, Vietnam, a lot of demonstrations. But the capital of the United States was not attacked. It was not invaded. It was not breached. The work of the Congress of the United States was not stopped because people were trying to get through the door. With some members trying to stop them, who then said these are just tourists. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell and other Republicans have said a commission is not needed because a House Select Committee could conduct the investigation. Democrat Hoyer has said that would be an option if the Senate does not pass the bill. But Democratic House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made clear in the House debate that it is not her preferred option. My colleagues, the press says to me, why don't you just go do your own task force, your own um, select committee and to investigate this? You have the votes, you have the, uh, the subpoena power, you have this or that. I said, I don't want to do that. We want this to be as it is shaped, bipartisan, with shared responsibility, shared staff, in a way that the public will have respect for the outcome. With the vote of 252 to 175, the House has sent the measure to the narrowly divided Senate, where its fate remains clouded. It would need at least 10 yes votes from Republicans to pass, and a filibuster by the minority party could prevent the bill from even being debated or amended.
Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. A woman heard shouting at police to bring Nancy Pelosi out to be hanged during the attack on the U.S. Capitol is among those charged in a new round of arrests announced today by federal officials in New York and Pennsylvania. They're criminals they need to hang. Bring her out. Pauline Bauer of Kane, Pennsylvania is heard shouting on body camera footage, according to a criminal complaint charged charging her with obstructing Congress and disorderly conduct. In the series of complaints announced today, Bauer is charged with the most serious counts from among two Pennsylvania residents and five from upstate New York charged with being part of the mob of former President Trump's supporters who pushed past police officers and broke through windows and doors on January 6th. More than 400 people have been charged so far in the siege. Yesterday, former Department of Homeland Security intelligence officials testified before the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee about the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. KPFA's Daniel Witte reports. Former Department of Homeland Security intelligence officials and civil rights experts testified about security measures that can be taken to prevent future attacks like the deadly January 6th insurrection at the U.S. Capitol while ensuring that civil rights are protected. Democratic Senator Gary Peters from Michigan says there was a lack of planning, breakdowns, and lack of preparation that allowed the January 6th attack to become a deadly encounter between protesters and security officials. Peters says steps can be taken to prevent future attacks. The Office of Intelligence and Analysis, along with other intelligence and counterterrorism agencies, failed to effectively identify the threat on January 6th. We need to understand the factors that led to that failure and what concrete steps can be taken to better understand the current threats that we face and ensure the Department of Homeland Security is effectively sharing information with local and state law enforcement. Peters says the Office of Intelligence needs to do more to combat the threats posed by white supremacists and anti-government violence that are dangerous to communities nationally. He says one major challenge that the Department of Intelligence faces is political pressure to downplay domestic terrorist threats. Peters says that during the Trump administration, the office reportedly didn't take threats of white supremacy seriously and censored certain intelligence information as the result of pressure from former President Donald Trump. Peters says a recent report from the FBI and DHS identified racially or ethnically motivated extremists, and most of the extremist threats were from white supremacists. Patricia Cogswell, a former deputy administrator at the Transportation Security Administration, also made suggestions of what can be done to prevent similar attacks. Engaging the fusion centers, DHSINA should support state, local, territorial, tarp, and tribal partners with training, information, and all source analysis that helps those partners based on the partner needs and collaborating with other DHS entities to enable an effective information sharing environment. DHS INA should support the design and funding of technical architectures and multi-use tools that enhance DHS's ability to match and exchange information where appropriate to achieve their missions. Officials say that the DRS needs to take actions now to prevent future attacks. For KPFA News, I'm Daniel Witte. The New York Attorney General's office says it's conducting a criminal investigation into former President Donald Trump's business empire. That is an expansion of what had previously been a civil probe. Attorney General Letitia James's investigators are working with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, 
which has itself been conducting a criminal investigation into Trump and his company, the Trump Organization, for two years. The Manhattan DA's office obtained Trump's tax records in February after a long legal fight to get them. The New York Attorney General's office offered no explanation for what prompted the change in its approach to the investigation or why it chose to announce it publicly. State and New York City investigators are examining whether Trump or his businesses manipulated the value of assets, inflating them in some cases and minimizing them in others to gain favorable loan terms and tax benefits. DA uh, DA Cyrus Vance's investigation also includes a look at hush money payments paid to women with whom Trump reportedly had affairs and the propriety of tax write-offs the Trump organization claimed on millions of dollars in consulting fees it paid, including money that went to Trump's daughter, Ivanka. Several tribes in Montana and legal nonprofits have filed a lawsuit this week to challenge two new state laws that they say disenfranchise Native voters. Arian Bolton reports. The American Indian Rights Fund and the ACLU of Montana filed the case in Yellowstone County District Court on behalf of the Blackfeet Nation, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes, Fort Belknap Indian Community, the Northern Cheyenne Tribe, and Western Native Voice. The case centers on two new laws that end same-day voter registration and prevent people from turning in someone else's absentee ballot if they are paid to do so. The Montana Democratic Party is also challenging new election laws in Yellowstone County Court. Tribes and their advocates say the laws disadvantage voters on rural reservations who have limited transportation and can't make multiple trips to register to vote and cast their ballots. Limited postal routes on reservations can also make it difficult for tribal members to cast absentee ballots by mail. Supporters say the laws add security to election procedures. Last fall, the same court struck down a law passed by voter referendum in 2018 restricting ballot collection efforts. For National Native News, I'm Aaron Bolton. As Wisconsin faces the divisive issue of redrawing its electoral districts, supporters of taking politics out of the process are making another attempt at a new system. Mike Moen has the story. At the state capitol, a bill has been reintroduced that would task the nonpartisan Legislative Reference Bureau with redrawing the state's political boundaries, which is done after each census count. The plan also calls for citizen input. Devin Anderson with the group Wisconsin Voices spoke at a rally this week in support of the measure. He says it's time to remove the opportunity for one party to create a landscape that leaves out black voices. Demand the state allow communities of color to have the influence they deserve on a statewide level. Watchdogs say when state Republicans controlled redistricting after the 2010 census, they drew the maps in secret that greatly benefited their party over the decade. The GOP is still in control this time, although Democratic Governor Tony Evers could veto their maps, setting off court battles. Republican leaders remain opposed to the bill that has resurfaced, saying Wisconsin's Constitution calls for legislators to guide the process. Even if the bill faces long odds, supporters note it does have bipartisan support. Its sponsor, Democratic Senator Jeff Smith, told this week's crowd that gerrymandered maps have played a role in the divided government seen today. Wisconsin is weary from highly partisan politics. Every head-scratching vote, every policy for the public good ignoring, ignored by lawmakers all stems from one issue, gerrymandering. The plan is separate from Governor Evers' People's Map Commission, which also faces GOP opposition. Supporters of enacting changes feel the public is on their side with more counties passing advisory referendums asking for an independent process. Last fall, nearly a dozen appeared on ballots across Wisconsin. Mike Moen, Wisconsin News Connection. And we're about halfway through the newscast tonight, and we are also here at KPFA about halfway through our spring fun drive. Trying to raise enough money to keep this listener-sponsored radio station on the air, as is KPFK in Los Angeles, as is KFCF in Fresno. 
all of us trying to raise the money over the air that we need to keep going because there is no alternative, there's no commercials, there's no corporate underwriting, there's no religious organization behind us, there's no foundation of the right, of the left, of the center, no foundation funding, no federal grants. What does that leave? Well, there's no state grants either, and as far as I know, there's no municipal grants. There's only the generosity that you, our listeners, grant to us, and that's kept this network of stations alive for seven decades. But each time, it's touch and go, because you never know. You never know when you open these microphones and you say, we need some listener support. Come on, gang, any up. Whether you're not, you're going to come through. You do, or at least you have so far. But there's no guarantee. And it is existentially <laughs> perilous <laughs> and emotionally <laughs> fraught. For the first time during the fun drive here at KPFA, we've been granted, the newscast has been granted the opportunity to extend the opportunity to you, the listeners, to double your support. Because we have been granted a matching grant generously put up by two listeners in Northern California, Kathy in Sausalito and Renee in Berkeley, combining their financial resources to the tune of $475. What that means is your contribution can be doubled if we're able to get an aggregate amount of contributions that total $475. If you're listening in Southern California, the number that you call is 818-985-5735. That's if you're listening to KPFK in Los Angeles. Same deal is available online at kpfk.org. If you're listening in Northern and Central California, the number to call is 1-800-439-5732 or online at KPFA. Dot org. We have a matching fund of $475. Your contribution doubled if we're able to make it. 1-800-439-5732. The number in Northern and Central California. 818-985-5735. The number in Southern California. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg said today he'll reinstate an Obama era pilot program that aims to aid minority and disadvantaged groups by ensuring local hiring for public works construction projects. Buttigieg made the announcement today at Washington's Frederick Douglass Memorial Bridge. He reverses a 2017 decision by the Trump administration to halt the program. The Transportation Department's four-year pilot initiative will let state and local agencies receiving federal transit or highway money impose local hiring preferences like those favoring veterans, minorities, and low-income workers. Supporters say it will revitalize regional economies by giving local residents new ways to access well-paying jobs. The Associated General Contractors of America opposes the program. The program had been scrapped by President Trump in 2017, reverting to rules set during President Ronald Reagan's administration, which prohibited geographic-based hiring preferences. President Biden has planned to use the two-week stretch before the Memorial Day to build Republican support for his $2.3 trillion infrastructure package. Nadia Ramlagan reports. 
Lawmakers are expected to make headway on President Joe Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure proposal this week, as Arkansas's aging infrastructure made headlines with the discovery of a large crack in the I-40 Hernando de Soto Bridge across the Mississippi River that led to its indefinite closure last week. U.S. Chamber of Commerce Vice President Ed Mortimer says shipping and supply chain disruptions will likely become more common if significant spending isn't directed toward major transportation improvements. Because of our inadequate infrastructure at the moment, we lose $170 billion annually in lost productivity. Senate Republicans are soon expected to deliver a revised version of the proposal to the president. Greg Regan is president of the Transportation Trades Department at the AFL-CIO. He says the issue is closely tied to good jobs. I would say every single job in this country at some level is directly connected to our infrastructure system, whether it's because people use it or the people that build and operate and maintain it. And everybody suffers when we have this level of neglect. Mortimer adds that decades of underfunding and deferred maintenance have pushed infrastructure across the nation to the brink of failure. So we need to make these investments now to make sure we are getting the best out of our national network. We're competing in a global economy and we have an improved quality of life for every single American. According to the American Society of Civil Engineers, driving on roads in need of repair in Arkansas cost each driver $671 per year. Around 5% of bridges are rated structurally deficient and 193 dams are considered to be high hazard potential. For Arkansas News Service, I'm Nadia Rumla. Gone. The director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention told a Senate panel today that coronavirus case rates are continuing to drop in the United States, while an ever-increasing percentage of the U.S. population is vaccinated. The last two days, we've had case rates that have been less than 20,000 per day. Our case rates now are around 30,000 per day on average for the last seven days. Death rates we haven't seen at around 500 a day, still too high, but the lowest we've seen since this pandemic began. We have over 86% of Americans over the age of 65 who've received their first dose of vaccine. And just yesterday, today, we, uh, we have now 60% of Americans over the age of 18 having received their first dose. Of vaccine. Rochelle Walensky also said that the gaps in staffing, labs, and other resources in the federal and state public health systems contributed to the spread of the pandemic. Four more California counties are moving to the least restrictive yellow tier of coronavirus restrictions. Santa Clara, Santa Cruz, Amador, and Orange counties. Santa Clara will become the third yellow tier county in the Bay Area, joining San Francisco and San Mateo. A smiling Dr. Sarah Cody stepped to the microphone at her regular outdoor briefing without a mask. Santa Clara's public health officer said the county was making some big changes because of its high vaccination and low infection rates among the local rules being lifted. Requirements that businesses maximize the number of staff who are teleworking. Return to the workplace comes with conditions, though. One, it requires employers to determine the vaccination status of their employees. Two, it defines safety rules for employees who remain unvaccinated. And three, it continues to require that workplaces in schools uh, report to us when they have a COVID case. And that's it. Cody said that for the first time in a long time, she feels optimistic that what she called team vaccine is winning against the coronavirus. Just by way of illustration, our case rate now is a third of what it was less than a month ago. Our positivity rate is 0.5%, which is the lowest that we've ever recorded. And most importantly, over 75% of our residents ages 16 and up have had at least one shot. And nearly 60% of those 16 and up are fully vaccinated, fully protected against COVID. So this is really fantastic. Altogether, 13 California counties are now in the yellow tier, 35 in the orange, 10 in the red. No counties are in the purple or most restrictive tier. More than 34.8 million vaccines have been administered in the state, and the seven-day positivity rate is down to just 
nine-tenths of one percent. During a virtual meeting of the California Travel and Tourism Commission, Governor Newsom noted, however, that since the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommended looser masking guidelines last week, there has been a decline in vaccinations. He said that's creating some pause and a little bit of concern. Newsom has indicated California will do away with the tiered system and masking requirements on June 15th. Santa Clara County's Dr. Sarah Cody acknowledged that for those who have been strictly complying with masking requirements, removing the mask where appropriate feels strange. I will admit to you, it is difficult after wearing this mask for so long to feel comfortable without it on, despite the fact that I'm vaccinated. And it's going to take time for many of us to make that change. A legislative committee says nearly a third of California's restaurants permanently closed and two-thirds of workers at least temporarily lost their jobs as the pandemic set in. The California Restaurant Association says that the industry once included more than 76,000 eating and drinking establishments employing 1.8 million people. But with the shutdown, as many as a million workers were furloughed or laid off, the state Senate Special Committee on Pandemic Emergency Response says restaurant employment is still down one quarter from before the pandemic. Industry leaders said they fear a lack of workers may shut down more establishments as the economy reopens, although they expect an eventual rebound. And this reminder here about our fundraising effort here on the evening news. For the first time, we've been granted a matching challenge of $475 put up by Kathy in Sausalito and Renee in Berkeley. That means we can double our money if we are able to get enough of you to double your money by making a contribution. If you're listening in Southern California, please call us at 818-985-5735 and your $100 contribution could become $200, your $75, $150. You can also do that online at kpfk.org if you're listening to KPFK in Los Angeles, if you're listening to KFCF in the Central Valley or KPFA in Northern California, the number 1-800-439-5732 or online at kpfa.org. We've got $475 in matching funds on the line at risk. Most coronavirus restrictions are being lifted across the tri-state of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut today, marking a big moment in the fight against COVID-19. Starting today, almost every business is allowed to operate 100% of capacity. There are some discrepancies between the states when it comes to mask mandates. In New York and Connecticut, all fully vaccinated people can safely drop the mask and stop social distancing, even indoors and in large crowds. Capacity limits have been lifted and there are no more mask or social distance requirements for those who are fully vaccinated. Sarah Walton reports from New York. Fully vaccinated New Yorkers are now allowed to ditch their face masks in most places. Businesses like restaurants, stores, offices, museums, theatres and places of worship are no longer required to limit the number of people allowed in. Indoor events can also increase their capacity from 100 to 250 people, but it can be more if attendees provide proof of vaccination. I'm Sarah Walton in New York. Republicans are rebelling against the requirement that they wear a mask on the House floor, stoking tensions with majority Democrats. Democrats who are refusing to change the rules following updated guidance from federal health officials. Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy of California led an effort today to get the office of the attending physician to update its guidance for mask wearing for vaccinated lawmakers and staff while they are in the House chamber and in committee hearing rooms. Democrats defeated it along a party-line vote of 218 to 210. Lawmakers can remove their masks when speaking on the House floor, but otherwise must keep it on when they are in the chamber. There is no requirement for wearing masks in the Senate chamber. Democratic lawmakers say they're tired of the requirements, too, but they worry that scores of their Republican colleagues are refusing to be vaccinated. 
could spread the virus. Some Republican lawmakers opted to go without a mask during votes yesterday, with a few taking particular care to stand in the well of the chamber to ensure that spectators, colleagues, and C-SPAN's cameras could not miss them. Their defiance could come at a financial cost. Lawmakers who refuse to wear masks are subject to a fine of $500 for the first offense. Subsequent offenses can result in a $2,500 fine. Meanwhile, some tribes in New Mexico are keeping their masking mandates in place as national and state COVID protections are eased. Antonia Gonzalez reports. Zuni Pueblo is alerting community members the face mask mandate is not lifted. The Zuni COVID-19 Incident Command in a memo this week stated all community members and visitors must continue to wear a face mask when out in public both indoors and outdoors. The message cites efforts to continue to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and help protect those who are at high risk. The Navajo Nation's mask mandate remains in place reservation-wide, which spans New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. Masks are required in public, both indoors and outdoors, on the Navajo Nation. Navajo leaders point to the fight against COVID-19 for keeping the mask mandate. Last week, the state of New Mexico updated its public health order and adopted federal mask guidelines for fully vaccinated individuals. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's updated guidance on face masks for fully vaccinated people no longer require to wear a mask either indoors or outdoors. I'm Antonia Gonzalez. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. Trouble to report on the financial front here as we try to raise some money during this newscast to keep this newscast and to keep this radio station on the air. We were given the challenge of raising $475 in matching funds conditionally contributed by Kathy of Sausalito and Renee in Berkeley, conditionally pledged. And the condition is that the money be matched. And we are not doing it. We are, we are failing abysmally here. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org. If you're listening to this newscast in Northern and Central California, if you're listening in Southern California to KPFK in Los Angeles, The website is kpfk.org, and the phone number is 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735. I mentioned this is the first matching amount that we've been entrusted with during the fund drive thus far, and if we struggle to make it like this, it may be the last. 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732 to help us accomplish this or online at kpfa.org. Southern California, 818-985-5735. Meanwhile, as dire as our plight is, must continue with the news because that's the purpose of this program. So here we go. It was a grand day today for French cafe and restaurant terraces as they reopened today after a pandemic shutdown of more than six months. The French government is lifting restrictions incrementally to stave off a resurgence of the coronavirus. As part of its first move, France's 7 p.m. nightly curfews moved back to 9 p.m. Museums, theaters, cinemas reopening with limited capacity. Starting June 9th, France will welcome tourists from non-EU destinations 
provided they have some sort of coronavirus passport or health pass. The final phase of the three-stage reopening plan for France, scheduled for June 30th, when the curfew will end and all other restrictions will be lifted if pandemic conditions allow. Belgium, Hungary, other nations already started allowing outdoor dining while drinking and eating indoors began on Monday in Britain's pubs. Restaurant cinemas, theaters, sports facilities in Austria reopened today after more than six months of closure due to the coronavirus pandemic. Several German states, including the capital city of Berlin, will be loosening coronavirus restrictions in the coming days after more than six months of lockdown as the number of new infections keeps dropping nationwide. Trent Murray reports from Berlin. From Wednesday, residents in the German capital will no longer have to stay at home after 10pm, with the COVID-19 curfew lifted thanks to falling infection rates. Outdoor swimming pools have also been given the green light to open, and shoppers wanting to visit non-essential retail stores will no longer have to book an appointment beforehand. The relaxing of the rules represents the first steps out of lockdown for Berlin, which has seen bars and restaurants close since November last year. That will change this coming Friday, though, with hospitality venues, including beer gardens, allowed to serve patrons again outdoors. Trent Murray, Berlin. The European Union has taken a step toward relaxing travel for visitors outside the bloc, with EU ambassadors agreeing on measures to make it easier for fully vaccinated visitors to get into countries. They also agreed on easing the criteria for nations to be considered a safe country from which all tourists can travel. Up to now, that list included only seven nations. EU countries still have to formally approve the measures. Reporter Stuart Smith from EU headquarters in Brussels. The plan would reportedly mean people can come from countries with fewer COVID-19 cases than 75 per 100,000 people. But even for countries that don't fit the bill, travellers who can prove they've received a European regulator-approved vaccine could still enter, potentially opening the door to Americans. Stuart Smith. And Stuart Smith was reporting from Brussels. India has reported more coronavirus deaths in a single day than any other country at any other time during the whole pandemic. The health ministry reported a record of 4,529 deaths in the past 24 hours, driving India's confirmed fatalities past 283,000. Both figures are certainly undercounts. The record death toll comes while infections continue to spread through vast rural areas with weak health systems. Crematoriums have run out of wood and hundreds of bodies are washing up on the banks of the Ganges River. Ishan Garg reports from New Delhi. The government claims that India's mortality rate is among the lowest in the world. But overburdened crematoriums across the country tell a different story. Experts say that's because official numbers are a gross underestimation of the real situation. They're concerned that tens of thousands of deaths are going unreported every day, especially in rural areas where medical infrastructure is fragile. Doctors say COVID deaths occurring outside of hospitals are not included in the official data, and neither are those who've succumbed to the infection. Infection before they could get tested. Ishan Garg, New Delhi. An extended COVID-19 eviction moratorium is set to expire next month. And tenant rights activists are calling on San Francisco Mayor London Breed to use Prop I funds that voters approved last year to help pay back millions of dollars owed in back rent by those adversely affected financially by the pandemic. Christina Honestead reports. San Francisco tenants, advocates, and Supervisor Dean Preston are calling on Mayor London Breed to use Proposition I funding to help those struggling to pay back rent due to the COVID-19 shutdown. This comes as state and federal moratorium on COVID-19-related evictions is set to expire next month. We are in an emergency, in a crisis situation uh, when it comes to rent debt and and uh, threat of displacement. That's Dean Preston, San Francisco's socialist supervisor. He says according to the city's budget and legislative analyst's office, tenants in San Francisco owed as much as $196 million in unpaid back rent in October. We have 
one solution locally. Fortunately, the San Francisco voters went to the ballot and passed Proposition I with the intent to fund rent relief and affordable housing in San Francisco. Um, the projections uh, have been exceeded. So we are, are receiving uh, tens of millions of dollars in unexpected Prop I revenue. This was the tax on the highest end real estate transactions and is going to fund rent relief. Um, the problem is that the mayor has not committed uh, to including in her budget a line item to make sure that those Prop I revenues go as intended to benefit renters through rent relief. Preston says Prop I funding could infuse $50 million this year towards eliminating tenants' rent debt, and it's projected to bring in another $62 million next year. State and federal funding has been set aside to help San Francisco tenants pay owed rent, but Preston says that $52 million has yet to be administered. Christina Soriano says she's lived in a studio in the Richmond district since 2010, but became unemployed after the pandemic. Her husband, Jonas De Gregorio, who moved to the U.S. just before the outbreak, also lost his job. They say they've applied for state relief, but haven't received a dime yet. I'm a piano teacher, and my hours were reduced because of the pandemic. Um, since then, they've been really reduced, so I'm um, unemployed. We've been paying 25% of the rent since November. We have about 10,000 or 10,000 or more that we owe. I moved to the United States in 2019. I got my green card and I started to work immediately in a restaurant. And a few months later, the, lo the lockdown imposed all restaurants to close. So my, my work was immediately impacted. I could not work anymore. And uh, I was not even able to benefit of any unemployment because uh, as a person that recently immigrated in the United States, and I think this is a true emergency. Tenants and advocates have a petition urging Mayor Breed to use Prop I funding for rent relief. It's garnered about 1,000 signatures. A statement from the mayor's spokesperson, Andy Lynch, tells KPFA the mayor's budget does include Prop I funding, but said that funding is meant to go to the city's general fund. He fell short of issuing support for Preston's proposal, but said the supervisors will have a chance to provide input before the mayor signs the budget. I'm Christina Onestead, reporting for KPFA. Two and a half minutes left in this newscast. Two and a half minutes left to meet our matching goal. $475 of matching money still on the table at risk. one 800 439 5732, the number to call, Northern and Central California, Southern California, 818-985-5735. Pioneer comedian Paul Mooney was Richard Pryor's longtime writing partner and whose social activism put the issue of race front and centers died in Oakland at the age of 79 of an apparent heart attack. Mooney's friendship and collaboration with Pryor began in 1968, lasted until Pryor's death in 2005. Together, they confronted racism perhaps more directly than it had ever been before on stage. Mooney wasn't as widely known as Pryor, but his influence on comedy was extensive. As head writer on In Living Color, Mooney helped create and inspire the Homie D. Clown character. He played the sage Negro Damas on The Chappelle Show. Negro Damas, <laughs> what mistakes did Michael Jackson make before he got arrested? Michael Jackson should have not been a singer. Michael Jackson should have been a priest. Then he would have just been transferred. <laughs> you man. Negro Thomas, why is President Bush so sure Iraq has weapons of mass destruction? Because he has the receipt. <laughs> Next question. Comic Paul Mooney dead at the age of 79. 40 seconds left to get to our goal. Oh my goodness. 1 800 439 5732. Matching money still on the table. 818 985 5735 if you're listening in Southern California. 
continued sunny and windy in the San Francisco Bay Area with a high in the low 60s around the bay. Slightly warmer inland in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow. Cooler, sunny and windy tomorrow with highs in the low 70s. And in Los Angeles, partly cloudy, highs in the low 70s. That's it for the news tonight for this Wednesday, May 19th. Good evening. Tune in Wednesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Bay Native Circle, bringing you today's Native issues, people, culture, and events with weekly rotating hosts. Then at 8 p.m., it's Dead to the World with Tim Lynch, featuring the music of the Grateful Dead, the music it's influenced and influenced by. And the night at 10 p.m. with Sing Out, a showcase of the world's ever-changing music realm, hosted by Larry Kelp. That's Wednesday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 